What is light? I was taught in high school that light is an electromagnetic wave. But what does that mean? What does light have to do with electricity and magnets? Well, I think the best way to understand it is to talk about why and how Michael Faraday dreamed up this wild idea way back in 1846. This is a story of internalized sexism, a presumptuous college student, mysterious crystals, and a very fortuitous case of stage fright. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. On February 2nd, 1826, a Scottish woman named Mary Somerville published a paper on her experimental research in the philosophical transaction, becoming the first woman to publish experimental work there in its 161 year history. Years earlier, an Italian named Morinchini claimed that he could magnetize iron bars with ultraviolet light, but no one else seemed to be able to repeat his experiment. However, Somerville said, she found a way to use bright sunlight to magnetize needles. This was six years after a Danish man named Orsted had found that current in a wire can move a magnet, or current in a wire creates a magnetic force. Therefore, it seemed logical that the different forces would be related, light, electricity, and magnetism. Unfortunately, three years later, her experiment was disproven. Devastated, Somerville burned all copies of her work and decided experimental research was impossible because as everyone had told her, women can't do research. She bemoaned, quote, originality is not granted to my sex. We are of the earth. Original genius in science is hopeless. Somerville went on to publish articles and books on mathematics and other people's research in science, but basically gave up on conducting her own research from that time on. Fast forward 17 years to 1845. Michael Faraday was 54 years old and was already famous for his discovery of the first motor, the idea of magnetic fields, and induction, as well as thousands of other discoveries. He also suffered from severe depression and memory problems, as well as possibly mercury poisoning, a common affliction for scientists at the time, as they didn't know the dangers of mercury. He was therefore spending very little time in the laboratory. This is when a baby-faced 21-year-old math student named William Thompson, later knighted Lord Calvin, presumptuously wrote Faraday and asked him if he'd ever changed something called the polarization of light with magnets or electricity when the light was going through a transparent material. Faraday was intrigued. Ever since Morikini's and Somerville's disastrous experiments, Faraday had been trying and failing to alter magnetism with visible light or to alter light with magnetism. He'd even previously tried to change the polarization of light, but never while the light was going through a material. Inspired, Faraday went back into the lab. What is polarization? Well, imagine you're making a wave on a rope. To make the wave, you can move your hand up and down and the wave would move away from you down the rope. However, if you wish, you could also move your hand side to side the direction of vibration is called the polarization of the wave. Most light is what is called unpolarized or randomly polarized, meaning that some is vibrating up and down, some side to side, and even some in clockwise and counterclockwise circles. In 1815, a Scotsman named David Brewster found an equation for an unusual phenomena. If light reflects off a surface at a low angle, currently called Brewster's angle, then all of the reflected light will be polarized parallel to the surface, or all of the light will vibrate parallel to the surface. This is why polarizing sunglasses work so well. They block the horizontally polarized light which is the light reflected at low angles, also called glare. Now we come to a strange object called an Iceland crystal. When light goes from air into a transparent material, the light slows down and bends. Iceland crystals are unusual because the amount the light bends depends on the polarization of the light. Therefore, when white light enters the crystal, it bends the light into two beams, one that vibrates vertically and one that vibrates horizontally as humans can't distinguish polarization with their naked eyes. The crystal makes two images. In 1828, another Scotsman named William Nicol made the last piece of the puzzle. He wanted to use Iceland crystals 
to remove one polarization entirely or to make the first polarizing filter. He called it a polarizing prism. He cut an Iceland crystal into an angled rectangle, then cut that into two triangles, then glued the triangles back together. Like all Iceland crystals, when light hits this prism, the light splits into horizontally and vertically polarized light. However, the horizontally polarized light is bent more and the triangles in the glue are designed in such a way that when this light hits the glue, all of the light is reflected. This is called total internal reflection and shines out the side. The vertically polarized light, however, bends less so that it bends through the glue and thus passes safely through the prism. Now we have all the pieces of Faraday's experiment. Faraday shined light from the brightest lamp he could get at Brewster's angle off a piece of glass, getting horizontally polarized light. He then put a nickel prism in the path of the light so that it filtered out the horizontally polarized light and he could no longer see the light from the lamp. He then placed a strong electromagnet, a magnet made with electricity, next to a sample of glass in the path of the light. When he magnetized the electromagnet, he could see the light from the lamp. The magnetic field had rotated the polarization of the light. When he unplugged the electromagnet, the image disappeared again. Faraday wrote that he had, quote, established, I think for the first time, a true direct relation and dependence between light and the magnetic and electric forces. Just as with Somerville, the scientific community was excited to hear that light and electricity and magnetism were linked in one great universal principle. However, unlike Somerville, Faraday's experiment has never been disproven. Also unlike Somerville, when Faraday made mistakes, it was never attributed to his gender. Faraday began thinking about what it meant to have light linked to electricity and magnetism. 16 years earlier, Faraday had created the idea of magnetic fields, or what he called lines of magnetic force. Faraday's idea was that magnets and current emanate lines of force that are visible with little metal shavings. Faraday felt that these fields explain magnetic forces. For example, the reason the two norths of a magnet repel is because their magnetic fields push against each other, and the north and the south attract due to their fields combining. Faraday also felt that electric charges also have lines of forces around them, or electric fields, which can explain electric forces. Even gravity has its own gravity field. Faraday created a thought experiment. Imagine two charges that are either electric or magnetic and are separated from each other, but are connected by their magnetic or electric fields. If you vibrate one, the other one will feel a force and vibrate as well. Faraday imagined that when the first object vibrated, it effectively plucks the field and creates a wave in that field. And the vibrating field is what makes the second object oscillate. Faraday then wondered if light was just a wave of one of these fields. This seemed like a pretty crazy idea, and Faraday was too reserved to express this in a talk or a paper. Then on April 3rd, 1846, Faraday was supposed to give an introduction to a lecture by a man named Charles Wheatstone. But Wheatstone chickened out at the last minute. Faraday stepped in for an impromptu talk, but he quickly ran out of material. So to eat up the hour, he talked freely about, quote, the vague impressions of my mind. Faraday told the astonished crowd about his thought experiment, which led him to say, quote, the view which I am so bold to put forth considers, therefore, radiation, i.e. light, as a vibration in the lines of force. Faraday was quick to add that these ideas were a little outlandish. Even to myself, my ideas appear only as a shadow of a speculation. However, they're basically what we believe today. We believe light is created when electrons, which are negatively charged particles, vibrate and create a plucked electric wave. Also, moving electric charges create a magnetic field. So a vibrating electric charge simultaneously creates a plucked magnetic wave. For this reason, light is called an electromagnetic wave. When you see a red rose in a garden, for example, that's because electrons in the sun vibrate which causes electrons in the rose to vibrate eight and a half minutes later, which cause electrons in your eye to vibrate, which sends an electric signal to your brain of red. But what is traveling between the sun and the rose or the rose and your eyes? 
a pulsed electromagnetic force field. Crazy, huh? I didn't know that. So if light is partially a magnetic wave, why did Mary Somerville's experiment magnetizing needles fail in 1826? Well, sunlight acts like a wave, so the magnetic field is always oscillating. Could sunlight then make a magnet vibrate? Good question and no. Sunlight has many different frequencies, i.e. colors, and many different directions, i.e. polarizations. So the magnetic force would be all over the place. Even if you had polarized light at a single frequency, like red laser light, it still vibrates at around 450 million million times a second. Way too fast for a magnet to respond. If you're having a little trouble understanding electromagnetic waves, think of how they felt in 1846. The royal astronomer, Sir George Airy said, quote, I can hardly imagine anyone who practically and numerically knows electrical theory that accepts anything so vague and varying as lines of force. Faraday's strange theories might have come to nothing if it weren't for young mathematical physicist named James Maxwell. In 1854, eight years after Faraday's talk, Maxwell wrote to his friend William Thompson, the same student who inspired Faraday to conduct his polarization experiment in the first place, asking for advice on what to read. Soon Maxwell was pouring through all of Faraday's experimental researches in electricity and began to add the missing spice, mathematics. How James Maxwell and his wife Catherine changed the world with some really difficult mathematics is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give me a nice thumbs up. I always like that. Also, if you want more information of how Faraday came up with magnetic fields in the first place, I have a video about that. You also might be interested in how Faraday escaped poverty to become a scientist. That's a good story. And check out the one about Maxwell. It should be a good one. And don't worry, I don't actually talk about the math. Okay, have a good day.